As a young cameraman and war reporter for United States television, I worked in several countries before being assigned to Israel to cover the volatile Middle East. I soon became aware of the complex nature of the area's problems, which brought pain and misery to all sides of the conflict. There was a bitter history of the Jewish minority dating back centuries. Violent anti-Semitic acts, such as pogroms against innocent Jews living in small communities. In Tsarist Russia, it was a frequent occurrence. Local bands of bloodthirsty vigilantes plundered the homes of their Jewish neighbors, inflamed by deep-seated prejudice encouraged by both church and government. During the Second World War, the Nazi government, assisted by their fascist allies, murdered six million civilians just because they were Jews. Finally, backed by the United Nations, the Jewish State of Israel was declared in May 1948. Immediately, five Arab neighboring nations with their armies tried, but failed, to destroy the young state. An armistice was finally signed in 1949. The Israeli government was hoping for a positive future after a grueling war. Afterwards, despite a seemingly peaceful atmosphere, there were sporadic acts of violence targeting the Israeli civil population. Once again, in 1967, tiny Israel, smaller than the U.S. state of New Jersey, was attacked by its neighbors, who quickly lost the war they had started. After some months of relative calm, I witnessed many violent acts of terror. When peaceful coexistence with its Arab neighbors seemed almost possible, Egyptian and Syrian armies succeeded in dramatically penetrating Israel's defenses on their northern and southern borders. Caught off guard on Yom Kippur, the holiest of Jewish holidays, the result was truly a day of judgment for the young state. With yet another great loss of life, Israel managed to turn seeming defeat into victory. Bowing to international diplomatic pressure, I reported on how Israel was forced to return the entire area of the Sinai Peninsula. Margaret Duv Duvani was not upset about being evicted from the Sinai, as long as she can remain in Israel. Ago. The values, the, the way of life in Israel, I, I think is 
for me anyway, a, a better way of life. It's, it's more family oriented and more time for family. When we first came to the Yamit area, I wanted my children raised in Israel. I wanted my children raised in a Jewish country as uh, confident, secure Jews. This is something that we hold very important. Gabi Karadas of Oklahoma also had to move his family from the Sinai. Now he's growing tomatoes in the Negev desert. He told us how he and his friends feel about what has happened. Most of the people that I've talked to, the ones that live on this Moshav, they all agree that it would be best to uh, give up the land to uh, accomplish peace. During the final days before the Israelis turn your meat over to the Egyptians, they prepared a symbol in the sand that they would leave behind, a dove of peace. At this moment in time, it seems to symbolize, if not confidence about the future, at least hope. Once again, peace proved elusive. My television crew filmed some of the 90 students held hostage by terrorists. Unfortunately, Israel's Arab neighbors chose to teach hate to their children for generations through their schools and youth groups. The cycle of violence against Israel mounted as the north of the country was hit by hundreds of rockets fired from Lebanon. Israel's northern border suffered a day of intense shelling from PLO terrorist forces in Lebanon. Over 700 rockets and shells fell on Israeli towns and settlements in one of the biggest attacks since the Arab-Israeli October War of 1973. The shelling caused extensive damage to homes, stores, and private property, and started many fires. Miraculously, only one Israeli was killed and a dozen wounded, despite the concerted effort of the gunners who pounded the area. This forced the Israeli army to neutralize the many sources of deadly fire, driving them steadily deeper into that country, eventually reaching the nation's capital, Beirut. I reported on the ceasefire that brought quiet. Now you can walk the streets of Beirut in peace. There's a ceasefire, but a few days ago, hundreds of shells and bombs were falling here. This is the eastern Christian section of the divided city, and the only evidence of war in the neighborhood are the ever-present sandbags. Outwardly, the Lebanese of Asafia go on about their business with a certain style, even after seven years of civil war and the present conflict between the Israelis and the PLO. With its smart shops and cafes, perhaps that's why Beirut has been called the Paris of the Middle East. Once again, international diplomatic pressure turned Israel's victory into a withdrawal from the conquered areas. The hope was that in the future, terrorists would be stopped by United Nations forces positioned between the two countries. That hope was not realized. As a step toward a peaceful solution to Arab terror from the south, the Israeli government decided to leave the Gaza Strip, relocating its 8,000 Jewish inhabitants. The pattern remained. Israel is attacked, is victorious, but international diplomatic pressure forces withdrawals, followed by renewed violence. Israel always seeks peace. Generations have prayed for it. Accords have proven fragile, but prayers for a better tomorrow survive. Israel's president, Reuven Rivlin, expressed this hope. Our treaties with Egypt and Jordan stand as witness to this strong desire and show our willingness to make painful compromises. Yes, painful compromises. If there is a real chance for peace and security, and I believe that there is a real chance for peace.